Number nine, a lot of people with varying degrees of vision either look up, wow, I say look up while looking down, good job, Molly. Hello and welcome. Today we are going to be talking about 10 unusual or unexpected ways that being blind can affect your physical body. Now, I think oftentimes when we think about different physical disabilities, we think of the very obvious ways in which they affect somebody. You can't see? Oh well, you can't see. Or, you know, you can't walk? You can't walk. Like those are just kind of the things that people think about, but there's obviously so many more ways that run so much deeper um, of how these disabilities actually affect our body, our day-to-day -day life, and how we function as a whole. Because at the end of the day, the body is an entire whole unit. And so when one thing is affected, as I will talk about, it can throw off other things. I have a lot of fellow disabled friends, differing disabilities from my own, and I've learned so much about how being in a wheelchair affects them. Or, you know, one of my best friends, Brenna, Brenna Huckabee, is a above the knee amputee, and I've learned so much about how that doesn't just affect walking, but affects her body in different ways. So I thought I would sit down and share some of the ways that I know being blind has affected my physical body. And these are things that I've learned through my medical team and professionals that I work with, as well as just through my own life experience and reflecting and aging. Because I think when you're younger, your body is so nimble. The older you get and the more repetitive these things become, the more it can begin to affect your body and you actually start to see the effects of these things from years prior. I hope all of that makes sense. I'll stop rambling. Actually, I won't. I'm probably gonna ramble this entire video. Most of these things are not obvious, but I'm going to start with the one that I feel like is the most obvious and I've talked about before, so I won't talk too much about it, but I need to talk about it because some of the others rely on you knowing this fact, so in case you don't. Number one, balance. A big part of balance is the combination of being able to see and being able to hear. Both deaf people and blind people, and of course deaf blind people, do have affected balance. Number two, I walk with a more flat foot. So I don't roll my foot the way people usually would. I'll try for some of these to maybe insert some B-roll or some clips to better demonstrate for those who can see but I don't roll my foot the way an average person would. I walk more flat footed. I pick up my foot and I put it down in front. And that is because number one, it helps me balance. Now these aren't things that I do intentionally. These are things that my body does to adapt and accommodate myself. So I'm not like aware of it. I'm aware of it. Professionals point it out to me and tell me, oh, you're supposed to roll your foot because X, Y, Z, it's better for this muscle and that muscle and this muscle. And I'm like, yeah, that's great, I can't. Because the moment I do that, my balance gets thrown off even more. I walk flat-footed to help me maintain my balance more as a way to accommodate and cope. Uh, and the other thing it does for me is it helps provide tactile feedback under my feet that I cannot see. Especially as a guide dog user versus a cane user, I don't get nearly as much tactile feedback as a cane user would, and I can't see the terrain under my feet. And so being able to feel it is very important for me, and walking with a flat foot helps me to feel what's under my feet better. Number three, going along with walking flat-footed, I take short strides. My gait is very narrow. I don't walk with wide strides. And this is something many people have pointed out to me throughout the years, that I take really short steps. And again, lots of professionals are like, it's bad for hamstrings, your hamstrings are too tight, X, Y, Z. Great, I get it. Wouldn't it be lovely if I could see and confidently take wide strides, but I can't. And so basically what I often do, again, not consciously, this is just how my body walks to accommodate, is almost where the one foot has stopped, the next begins. So I take really short strides because I can't confidently take a long stride because I don't know what's out there ahead of me. And I also need to maintain my guide dog's pole in the harness and him being in front of me. But if I start to take super long strides, all of a sudden I might now be in front of my dog. I've lost tension in the harness. That's dangerous. So I take really short strides. Again, I think it also helps with my balance um, and it helps me to more confidently take steps. When I take a wide stride, it's more risky. I don't know what's out there ahead of me. I also wanna point out, 
not all of these things are going to affect every single blind person. This is my experience and from talking to many other people, a lot of them experience these things as well. But of course, we're a wide community. There's tons of nuance. Everybody's going to be different and unique. Some people might be affected by some of these things, but not all. And some might be like, girl, I don't know what you're talking about. Also, of course, your level of vision loss, the mobility aids you use, your life experience, all of those things also affect these. Number four, hunchback. Your girl is a hunchback, okay? I have a hunch and I have struggled with posture from a very young age. I wanna say I was about 10 years old when people started bothering me about my posture. There's a few reasons for this that I have deconstructed. Number one, I spent my entire childhood hunching over a desk to try to see things on the paper beneath me that I could not see. And so I was always like this, trying to see what was beneath me, whereas sighted people can just look down and see their desk. I had to get really close to it, use my magnifying glass, all of these different things. So I hunched from a very young age for that reason. Number two, I think this also has to do with being able to confidently walk. When I walk with my back straight and I'm trying to be super conscious of my posture, I feel vulnerable and insecure. I feel like I'm going to walk smack into something, but when I hunch, it's almost protecting my body because my shoulder is going to hit something versus me just bang smack walking into something. It's like a protective thing. And people often will say, you don't look confident when you hunch. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> I can't see where things are. I'm not confidently walking. I am tentatively walking. I'm very tentatively walking in a world that I cannot see. I am not confidently walking. When I stand like this, I feel a lot more vulnerable and a lot more insecure. I actually feel less confident when I walk with my back straight because sure, I might visually look better, but I am feeling super scared. I feel less safe and less protected from the world. And it is something I try to work on because obviously not only is it sure aesthetically not attractive and people like to point that out to me, but also it isn't good for you, right? Like posture is important. And so it is something that I work on with my personal trainer, getting my core stronger, getting my back muscles stronger to pull my shoulder blades down. But I give myself grace and forgiveness that this is something about me that is a direct result of my blindness. And that is something that is out of my control. That is something that God gave me and I've made the best of it, but it has effects on my life outside of just not being able to see. Number five, this is definitely a super common one along with posture. Lots of blind people struggle with posture and lots of blind people struggle with one shoulder being higher or lower than the other. This is again, something most of us aren't conscious of until sighted people point it out. To me, it not only follows the line of posture, but also balance. Balance is a very visual thing, which includes physical balance of your own body. For example, when I am asked to say, lay down on a narrow table, like a massage therapy table, facial table, um, acupuncture table, whatever, I often don't lay straight because I don't, visually line my body up with the sides of the bed and as much as I try to feel I'm often slightly laying diagonal and they'll try to help me correct my body when I carry soup or a bowl of liquid or a cup I'm often carrying it whether it's with two hands or one slightly tilted and people are like you're gonna spill hold it flat to me it feels flat when I lay down I feel like I'm straight when I sit I don't feel like one shoulder is higher than the other but it often is I think one component of this is the use of a cane or a guide dog, whether it's with your left or your right. At all times, one of your arms is forward. You're holding it forward. And I think this also contributes to a more hunched or shoulder forward position. One of your arms is always pulled forward. It's, you know, using your cane in front of you or holding the harness with a bit of pressure in it with the forward momentum. And so one of your shoulders is always off kilter to the other one. And it can kind of over time slowly develop into one shoulder being held higher than the other. And then your muscles get pulled that way. I've got very tense, tight shoulders. It all goes hand in hand, your body as a whole. And over time, these things develop and grow into something bigger. Number six, 
Very similar to how I was mentioning earlier, your eye is an organ. And when one organ is affected, what I have been told by medical professionals is that it affects ultimately your whole body because it affects your nervous system. And so it kind of throws everything a little off kilter. I think that's super interesting. I've certainly always been prone to being more tired, to being more sick. That's partly probably just genetics and my own personal makeup, but I do think that my organ having a literal disease is of course going to throw things off in the rest of the body. Number seven. This one's a bit more obvious. Many of us deal with extreme headaches and eye pain and eye fatigue. I think this is especially common in those with progressive vision loss like my own because the eyes and the brain are constantly having to adapt and change, especially during periods of vision loss. I find during periods of significant vision loss, I deal with increased headaches and increased eye pain. For me personally, this feels like pressure behind my eyes, extreme tension headaches. And yeah, that's how it is for me, but it's definitely very common amongst blind people, especially those with progressive vision loss. Number eight, squinting. Another obvious one. Many of us are light sensitive, so we squint to see in the sunlight or just not be in pain rather. Um, many of us spent our childhood squinting to see things that we couldn't. So uh, Lord knows I am gonna have some solid crow's feet. But yeah, squinting. Many of us have spent our whole lives squinting from eye pain or to see things better or to focus our eyes. And uh, yeah, best believe crow's feet will hit hard. Number nine, a lot of people with varying degrees of vision either look up Wow, I say look up while looking down. Good job, Molly. Look down, look up, or even like their head crooked, tilted, either to the side like that or to the side like that. And that is often when somebody has different vision in both eyes. So one eye is significantly better than the other. When they don't have peripheral, when they don't have central, it is a coping mechanism to tilt to be able to better see. But when you are consistently tilting your head one way or the other, to see better. Also, a lot of people with nystagmus who can visually see the shaking look like this, almost head tilted back, eyes facing down, because it better focuses their nystagmus to stop the shaking visually. And so when somebody is consistently doing that, it's going to affect the muscles, the posture. Do you see how all of these things are interconnected? And again, these are things that aren't as present or apparent when you're younger, but when you've been doing it for years upon years upon years, it builds and it begins to affect the body more and more and more. So when you're always holding your head like this, the muscles on one side are gonna shrink, the muscles on the other side are gonna be looser. When I say shrink, I just mean tighter, they're gonna seize up more. And so then when you're informed that you're doing this or when doctors or medical professionals or whoever is like, that's really not good for your body to always be like that and you try to correct it and you become more aware of it, it's really tough because now these muscles on one side are tighter. The muscles on the other side are longer or looser. So it's a whole pain. Number 10, another more obvious one is rocking or fidgeting. Very common for blind people to physically rock their body side to side, forward to back. I notice that I often, when I'm say standing in a line, will rock back and forth on my feet. Like I will shift my weight from one foot to the other. I am not aware of it until I am. I'm like, oh, I'm doing that. I guess sighted people probably aren't doing that. Sighted people can fidget and rock too, but I think it's just more common in blind people because we're lacking the visual stimulation that sighted people are receiving. We're trying to physically create some form of sensation or stimulation for ourselves. I often carry around fidget toys. I did this when I was young. My occupational therapist recommended it. I stopped as I got older. Now I do it again. I don't care if it's socially acceptable or not. Screw it. Do not care. I love my fidget toys. And when I notice that I'm like rocking back and forth or something, I'm like, I think I need to fidget. And I will like pull out my little fidget toy. Or if in, I'm in just a very boring environment where I'm like, my brain really needs stimulation right now. Fidget toy to the rescue. I'll link some of my favorite fidget toys down below. Anyways, that's it. I hope this helped either parents, family members, loved ones, teachers to the blind. If you recognize any of these things, these tendencies, these physical representations of blindness in your loved one who is blind or person who's blind that you're working with, I am here to validate 
yes, those are real. And if you are blind and people point these things out in you, know that you're not alone. And if you haven't been able to connect the dots or nobody's connected the dots for you as to why you might deal with, say, a shoulder imbalance, a short gait, flat-footed steps, a hunch, any of these things, it is normal. Um, and though I do believe some of these things are important to correct just for overall physical holistic health, um, other things are more just aesthetically unpleasing to the sighted world. We don't need to fit in their box because we're not one of them. So we don't need to try. Until next time, you can click over here to watch one of my other list videos, like five more things all sighted people should know about blindness, or over here to watch another one of my blind related lists. Love you and I'll see you next time. Bye.